This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. The legal information presented on In Legal Terms is meant to provide general information about the topics discussed and is not necessarily the opinion of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. The information conveyed does not create any type of attorney-client relationship. Please consult an attorney provider before making any decisions about your specific legal questions. Welcome to... Welcome to In Legal Terms from MPB Think Radio, the show all about you and your rights. I'm Liz Gill with Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law. Hello, Professor Gershon. Good morning, Liz. How are you this morning? I am very excited because I have a new mask. (laughs) And, you know, just the the little things like that uh, get me excited. Yeah, me too. And, and, you know, I think we're all getting, getting used to this. And, and I'm really excited about this show as well because it's great to have uh, Professor Lisa Roy back on the show. She's uh, been a guest before, talked about law and religion, um, and always, always a pleasure to welcome her back. I, I wish uh, we could all be together at the law school again, and I hope that that happens soon. But, Lisa, good morning. And could you please tell us a little bit about your background? Good morning, Richard and Liz. Thank you so much for having me. Um, well, uh, you know, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm, I'm one of your colleagues at the law school, and I teach uh, constitutional law and law and religion. I also teach contracts, but my focus for many years has been in the area of law and religion, and in, in particular, uh, the intersection of church and state. And so that's what I like to, you know, read about and write about and uh, talk to students about. Well, this is such a timely uh, show to have you on because just last week, the Supreme Court uh, ruled on a case out of Nevada restricting attendance at churches and held that uh, Nevada's restriction was was constitutional. Could you talk a little bit about that? You were, you, by the way, I want to brag on you a little bit. Uh, Lisa ha- is a leading expert on law and religion, and in fact, uh, has chaired the National Law School Association section on law and religion. So we're really lucky to have you here to talk about this. So how, what happened in that case? Sure. Um Thanks, Richard. Yeah, the uh, Calvary Chapel case out of Nevada involved a challenge to a limitation on the ability of, of uh, churches and, uh, you know, mosques and synagogues and so forth to meet uh, with uh, the same kind of limitations that were applied to other types of entities and organizations. And so uh, they challenged really the governor's order uh, during the pandemic limiting uh, churches, houses of worship, um, uh, also kind of public lectures, museums, and movie theaters to uh, 50 people. Uh, uh, so groups, no more than groups of 50 people. And so the church challenged that on the ground that other types of entities, and, and the one that the real focus in the case was casinos, but bars, casinos, gyms, uh, restaurants, nail salons, et cetera, were only limited to 50% of their capacity. And so the challenge was uh, one based on uh, largely the free exercise of religion that is, uh, that is part, of our, part of our First Amendment under the Constitution. And so the church challenged that limitation. They wanted, they wanted uh, really an, an, equality, uh, an equality remedy. They wanted to be treated in the same way as the casinos and bars and gyms so that they could hold services um, at at least 50 percent of their capacity. And so it's a, it's a challenge that is currently still in the court, but it came before the Supreme Court on an injunction. And so uh, what they asked for was for the, for the courts to enjoin or to um, tell the governor that he could not enforce this requirement against the churches while it was pending in the courts. And so it made it all the way up to the Supreme Court and the decision that you mentioned, Richard, was the one that we got last week, where in a vote to five to four, the, the, the uh, Supreme Court denied the injunction. And we got in that case kind of an interesting, uh, an interesting um, development, which was a dissent from uh, four of the justices who disagreed with with the majority on uh, on the issue of whether the churches should be treated. Uh, it, the same way as the bars, the gyms, and the casinos. 
you know, I, I hate to say this, but I have a theory. This is my cynical theory is that uh, bars uh, and casinos and gyms are uh, taxable entities and, and, and their revenues are, can be collected by the state, whereas the, the church is not a taxable entity. And, and so, you know, I, ha- I hate to think that that's why states, uh, sp- especially limited churches as opposed to bars and casinos and things like that. But um, now, wh- when you talked about free exercise, I, I, why is this not an a, a infringement on free exercise to tell someone they cannot go to their church or their synagogue or their mosque uh, to pray? Uh, why is that? How can that not be uh, an infringement? Well, it is. Uh, you know, it certainly does. Uh, it, it, it creates a burden on free exercise. But during a pandemic, uh, there is, uh, you know, there, there kind of are different rules in play. And so you've got kind of a, a, a liberty concern and then an equality concern. And so apparently all the justices seem to agree on the liberty concern. That is that during a pandemic, even though this is core First Amendment activity, uh, you know, religious exercise and assembly, things that are explicitly mentioned in the First Amendment. Uh, during a, a, a state of emergency, like a pandemic, the government can impose some limitations on uh, the free exercise of religion that it otherwise would not be able to impose without the state of emergency. But really, the equality problem was was the um, the one that was that was really raised by the church and the one that troubled the dissenters. And so all of the dissenters seem to agree uh, that, uh, that that allowing certain some limits or, or uh, uh, imposing some limits during the pandemic uh, is is justified under the court's uh, under the court's doctrine. And this much earlier uh, this much earlier case from 1905, the Jacobson case, which we've all kind of heard a lot about during the pandemic. But the equality one is the one that's really puzzling. And so. Uh, it, it's sort of a tough argument to make that uh, the casinos, you know, can have potentially hundreds of people milling about for hours on end, and uh, that's not, you know, that's not a public health risk. But churches, and, and in this case, Calvary Chapel, I think they wanted to meet for, you know, like 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, they had social distancing and masks and all of that, which I think the casinos had uh, for the most part as well. Uh, but it's a tough argument to make that, um, that the casinos pose less of a public health risk than the churches. And actually, the test under under the free exercise clause, which has been the rule since about 1990, and which was uh, elaborated further a few years later in a case uh, that was decided unanimously in favor of a group that challenged public health laws because they practiced uh, animal sacrifice as part of their religion. The test coming out of those cases is that uh, if the government decides to grant exceptions, if the government does uh, what what governments really around the country now are doing uh, by sort of creating categories and putting different groups and businesses and so forth into these various categories, to the extent that the government creates these categories and provides exceptions for secular activity, it's got to provide an exception for comparable religious activity or give a compelling reason why it's not doing that. And so that was kind of a puzzling um, a puzzling part of this case. Um, it's a pandemic. Certainly, um, you know, these, these rights can be limited during a pandemic. All the justices seem to agree on that. But where, where, where the disagreement arose was on this equality part of it. And so the, and so the dissenting justices really thought uh, that, that the governor of Nevada hadn't given any reasons why and certainly not compelling reasons why casinos should get priority over what uh, over what the churches wanted to do. And, and so I mentioned it's still in litigation, and so it's possible that, you know, what the Supreme Court has said at this point is that it's not granting an injunction, which means there's not a, you know, high likelihood uh, that their rights have been clearly violated here. But I imagine that they are, you know, going to continue, uh, continue to litigate this case and perhaps uh, you know, get into more of the sort of uh, details around public health. That's so interesting. I, I, I mean, I, is there an argument uh, that you don't have to go to a building to exercise free religion, whereas you do have to go to the gym to use the equipment or or to, to, to the bar to, to, you know, have a drink with someone? Or I mean, is that is that... A, a legitimate argument. I know that that's an argument that has been been raised. 
Yeah, that's an interesting argument. Um, I, I suppose, I mean, there are, you know, maybe assembly issues. I know that maybe some of that gets into a little bit of kind of um, maybe denominational differences or even more broadly kind of differences between different types of religious practice. Um, but I think there's also a sort of a competence issue there that comes up. It's in the background, I think, in all of these cases, but it certainly comes up in the, you know, in, in, in the context of the argument that you raise, and that is, do we really want courts kind of telling churches, telling religious organizations, well, you, you know, you, you can't practice this way, but why don't you practice sort of this other way? And then I, I think that's come up before in the context, you, you may recall around Easter, uh, when we were still, uh, you know, on, I think most of the country really kind of locked down, uh, on, on quarantine, kind of sheltering in place, there uh, were churches that wanted to have drive-in Easter services. And so that would be an example of what you're talking about, that if, you know, church is thinking about, well, how do we get out of the building and still uh, find a way to meet? And, and yet and still a lot of those services uh, were, uh, were, if not prohibited, they were, uh, you know, severely limited. And that, that's kind of what, uh, what engaged the first round of, cha of, of challenges based on the free exercise clause. And so there certainly is a time when we're kind of thinking about all of these things uh, in a different way. Maybe there's more hugging in church than there are in uh, casinos. I guess there's high fives in casinos and shaking hands of peace maybe in church. We're going to continue our discussion of your rights during a pandemic. Which counties have the safe return executive order in effect? I'll tell you next. You're listening to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Susan Buttress, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center and host of Southern Remedies Relatively Speaking. Join us as we explore issues that relate to you and your family, from mental health obstacles and family interactions to handling life disruptions. Whatever the issue, let's try to figure it out together. You can listen live Tuesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. This is In Legal Terms. Not everyone has a chance to listen to our show live. If you've missed any of our program, you can listen to the whole show at inlegalterms.mpb online.org it's also available on the mpb public media app as are all our local shows i'm liz gill i'm here with professor richard gershon from the university of mississippi school of law okay i take reeves governor of the state of mississippi by the authority vested in me by the constitution and laws of the state of mississippi and in consultation with the state health officer do hereby order and direct as follows an executive order that applies to bolivar claiborne covington DeSoto, forest grenada harrison hines humphrey jackson jefferson madison panola quitman rankin sharkey simpson sunflower tallahatchie tate walthall washington and wayne counties for these counties the statewide safe return instituted in Executive Order 1492 as amended by Executive Order 14, uh, then a whole bunch of other ones. Anyway, it remains in effect until 8 a.m. Monday, August 3rd. These are the counties that have extra safe return regulations uh, imposed on them. This morning, we're talking with professor of law from the University of Mississippi School of Law, Alicia Shaw Roy, about the constitutionality of uh, uh, some of these restrictions on religious gatherings and mandatory mask orders. We have a couple of calls on the line. Let's go to Shirley in Starkville. Shirley, thank you so much for calling in today. Go ahead. 
Uh, yes, I think at some point uh, common sense should enter the conversation. If, um, especially when it comes to uh, students having and teachers having to return to school and uh, for, um, you know, the president saying that student, uh, that schools, districts will have federal funds held unless they go back. Um, our children, their teachers are, are more important uh, than, you know, any kind of um, uh, punitive thing being put in place, uh, you know, if, if people don't go back. And I think the, well, I know the people who are most vulnerable are people in areas like Mississippi. Now, I, I work for a nonprofit uh, that uh, tutors and that teaches GED. Uh, when the pandemic uh, first came, uh, when the, uh, the lockdown in effect, uh, we had the, the uh, schools to make packets for those students who didn't have access to uh, computers, uh, and some of us even contributed computers for those who didn't. But for those who didn't have access to the internet, we um, had packets made of, uh, you know, for the various classes, for the students, and so that the parents could come by the center and pick those up. Now, I understand that some of the school districts in the state are, are saying they'll, they will have uh, in-school uh, classes for the first nine weeks or so, uh, and then after that, if the COVID numbers go up, then they'll go to virtual. It should be just the opposite. Shirley, yeah. what's your question for our legal experts today? Okay, so I'm wondering at what point um, does common sense override so-called legality? Well, sure. That's a great question. I, got, I have to say on a personal note, my, my oldest daughter, I mean, not my oldest, my daughter uh, is getting ready to uh, start teaching in Rankin County, and they're planning on going live on August 10th, and this will be her first teaching job. So I'm, I'm nervous about that. I, I don't disagree with you about that. And I think, you know, a lot of this is really a lot of different uh, entities are involved in this. You've got uh, the federal government saying we're not going to we're not going to fund schools that don't go back into live teaching. Uh, I agree, you know that um, that to me seems an overstep and really not their purview. It really should be up to the school districts themselves. I mean, I hope I do hope common sense comes in, and I really do think that you know we have to look at our state leaders in that respect and the leaders of the various school districts and hope that they uh, make the right decisions for the health and safety of the. The children. I realize there are people who are trying to, to work and, and, and need for their children to be in school, uh, and so there are a lot of pressures there as well. It's not an easy answer, but, but your, your call for common sense is a good one. Is there a responsibility that uh, an individual school or a district or the Mississippi Department of Education, any responsibility uh, legally or, or financially that they would have to take on if a child or a school, uh, or if a child or a teacher runs into medical issues because they contracted COVID at the school or if they were to die, could there be a wrongful death suit? I guess you can always bring a suit, but whether it would they would actually be responsible. My understanding is that uh, there are movements in uh, both in Congress, but also uh, you know just generally to protect entities from liability uh, if they reopen. Um, you know, I think uh, rather than taking that step, I would rather us actually you know think about the health and safety of the children and the teachers. Uh, you know, our students, We, Lisa and I have students who are taking the bar exam today in some states where it's being offered live. And, you know, I worry about that. A lot of states went online. A lot of states uh, delayed or, or gave limited licenses to, uh, to practice without having to take the bar because of the pandemic. So it varies. It really does. It varies from state to state. It varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Uh, and and so, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens. But in terms of liability, I think probably there are protections from liability 
and uh, entities that do open up. Thank you, Shirley. We appreciate your call. Let's go to Bill, who has called in from ETA today. Bill, thanks for calling into In Legal Terms. What's your comment or question? Well, I just more or less have an observation. Um, earlier you were talking about the reason why the churches weren't allowed to, to be open as opposed to some of the businesses. And I think probably the reason was because they couldn't tax it. We're just, our society is too secular. It's absolutely too secular. I, I know that is a decision that each individual has to make because nowhere in the Bible did the Lord force anyone to accept him. He was, they were allowed to reject him. But uh, the comment is this, until we turn our hearts back to God and take him seriously, and submit ourselves to him, we are going to continue to have these kind of problems. Bill, that, I appreciate that's you. That's just it. That's, that's what I wanted to say, and I appreciate you giving me a chance to say it. Well, thank you, and I appreciate your observation. Yeah, Professor Gershon, that had never occurred to me that I guess I'm kind of naive enough. I hadn't thought about who generates tax revenue as maybe a, a possible reason on why uh, this group could open or why this other group could open? Well, I'm just a cynical tax <laughs> professor. But, you know, Liz, you know, uh, you, we're, you know, so we're talking to Lisa uh, Roy, who is an expert in constitutional law, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the, the state constitution as well because it comes into play. But, Lisa, you know, when we talk about a, uh, a, a gen- restrictions on uh, freedoms during a health crisis, does the government do governments have greater latitude to restrict those freedoms because of a health crisis? Well, they do, Richard. They do. Um, you know, I mentioned um, a little earlier when we were talking about free exercise and the pandemic um, that there's a, a decision from many years ago, from 1905, Jacobson versus Massachusetts, and so uh, that was a case in which uh, in which the court held that uh, a mandatory vaccination against smallpox in, in, uh, in, uh, in the context of an ex- epidemic was not a violation of constitutional rights. And so uh, that, uh, that precedent is still good law. And so uh, many lower courts have held that, uh, that the government does, in fact, have kind of these you know, broad powers during a pandemic that would not exist otherwise and um, there was an earlier case in fact involving a challenge uh, by a church to some of these limits in california the south bay decision in may and so that was another uh, that was another one that reached the supreme court uh, in, in the posture of a request for an injunction the supreme court denied it again it was five to four uh, it was similar to Calvary Chapel. The facts maybe were not uh, quite as stark as, as Calvary Chapel, but uh, the Chief Justice wrote a concurrence, which again is unusual in that context, but he wrote a concurrence, which uh, has, has has now kind of been sort of authoritative for a lot of lower courts, and he cited Jacobson. And he said that in this context, um, elected officials have kind of this broad uh, latitude that they're politically accountable in a way that judges uh, judges are not, and so they shouldn't be second guessed. And I guess when we had uh, September 11th, uh, the Patriot Act, wasn't that uh, to give different departments a little uh, extra leeway and powers they didn't have to begin with? Well, sure. I mean, that was a different context, and so that wasn't a public health context. But um, there's certainly, um, you know, there's certainly precedent for the idea that, uh, you know, in wartime or in other kind of, uh, you know, times of emergency, the government has more power than, than it might ordinarily have. We have a call. We're going to go to Greg, who has called in from Columbus. Greg, thanks for being part of In Legal Terms. What's your comment or question for us? Uh, My question for the professor is, uh, what's the definition of arbitrary as far as decisions? Because I've flown recently on American Airlines. There is no empty seat. I'm three inches away from everybody in a packed cabin. And we all have masks on. But I can't go into a barber shop and wear a mask and have a barber cut my hair. 
Uh, I can go into Lowe's and Walmart, and I'm just guessing because Lowe's, Walmart, Delta, American, they've all got deep pockets and they've got attorneys. But the local barber downtown and a whole bunch of other businesses where you could also wear masks and conduct business, um, they're shut down. But yet I can fly in an airliner from Memphis to Dallas, Dallas to Minnesota, and I have in a packed airliner sitting three inches from somebody else. And, by the way, nobody's making them wear their mask. Half the people have them down below their nose. And so it really doesn't do much anyways. And then uh, something else I'd ask his uh, opinion on, uh, these arbitrary decisions, whereas like here in Columbus, uh, the mayor and city council, well, you have to wear a mask. Well, as long as you wear a handkerchief over your face. Biologically speaking, that's doing zero, nothing. I know people have a hard time with that because you're looking at it and it's like, well, look, there's a cloth in front of his face. Molecules don't care about cloth. Uh, when you get down to 20 nanometers for an oxygen molecule, you look at 200 nanometers or less for a COVID molecule, and, or, um, and they'll sift right through that cloth. I know people have a hard time grasping that, but on the molecular basis, that little bandana does almost nothing. The surgical mask, only a 44% uh, thing. And then the N95, of course, that's, you might say, the best that we got out there, except wearing a hood and a filter around your waist or something like that. But as far as the definition of arbitrary, uh, could the professor comment on that? Does he see these as being arbitrary rules and restrictions on certain businesses with small pockets? And I'll thank you for your time, and thank you for letting me make my comment on the radio. I appreciate it. Well, I mean, that's a good question. I, you know, um, arbitrary, we usually assume the courts, in, in particular in governments, won't, or at least you correct me if I'm wrong, uh, and, you know, you're, the, you're our constitutional law expert, but we assume that governments act in good faith and that their decisions and courts' decisions are not arbitrary, but uh, we, do have, uh, we do have a mechanism for, and that's what the Supreme Court does, is it looks to see if, if laws are arbitrary. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, finding somebody guilty just because they have a beard uh, in a criminal case would be a, a, an example of arbitrary. Uh, you know, but it's hard, you know, if you, if you look at the, the, you know, I think everybody's trying to figure this out. I think it's probably the best way to put it. And so, I, I, you know, as, as governments at, try to act in good faith, try to protect citizens, try to figure this out, figure out what businesses are essential and what businesses aren't. Uh, the airlines, certainly, I think people do still have to, in some cases, travel for work. Uh, and so the airlines have some essential function. But what is essential? I mean, you know, again, is getting a haircut essential? Uh, we know grocery stores are. So it, it's you know, arbitrary. I, I think it, it really just means that they're not, uh, not based on a fair application of the law. So you could make some argument uh, that some of these uh, outcomes seem arbitrary. I think that's I, I think that's true, and you know I certainly can you know can can understand I think the perspective that, that the caller shares, and I think a lot of you know a lot of a lot of uh, you know people are you know, looking at some of the results and and questioning how the lines are being drawn. I think in terms of the constitutional uh, standard, it, I think it's very broad, and so as, as Richard said, I mean unless it, it appears maybe a government is targeting a particular industry and, and that can you know that could be shown then they're probably going to get the benefit of the doubt particularly uh, you know in in the context of a pandemic where you know there are uh, you know many questions about uh, you know about what the best uh, you know or what the best uh, process should be for uh, you know trying to trying to mitigate its effects. We're talking with Lisa Shaw Roy, professor of law at the University of Mississippi School of Law, about your rights, your constitutional rights during a pandemic. Whether it's constitutional or not, some cities are giving out fines for not wearing a mask. What are they? I'm going to tell you next. You're listening to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio.
Hey, this is Malcolm White. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. Every week we talk with visual artists, musicians, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcast app. You're listening to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. Professor Richard Gershon is our expert host. I'm Liz Gill. We hope that you subscribe to our podcast. Lots of different podcasting platforms out there, probably dozens. I happen to like Podcasting Addict for my Android phone. If you have an Apple one, there's already a podcasting platform on there. I downloaded the app to my phone, and I touch a plus that takes me to the page to search for a podcast. I typed in in legal terms in the search area, and it brought up our show in legal terms. And then I was able to touch the photo, and then I'm notified uh, whenever any, ever any new episodes are loaded up. This morning, we're talking about restrictions on religious gatherings and mandatory mask orders, that constitutionality, with our guest, Lisa Shaw Roy, professor of law at the University of Mississippi School of Law. Now, according to the Mississippi Center for Public Policy, Jackson restaurants, Jack, sorry, Jackson residents could be fined three hundred dollars and sent to jail for six months for violating mask uh, orders. Businesses could be shut down for a day. The fine in Canton for an individual is five hundred dollars and a thousand dollars for businesses in Columbus and Greenwood. If you violate some of their mask orders, you could be fined up to a thousand dollars and also. Also, there's a $1,000 fine that applies to businesses in Oxford. We have a call this morning, and it's William who has called in from Tennessee. William, what's your comment or question this morning for In Legal Terms? Sure. Good morning. Um, I was just curious in terms of the professor's opinion, both of them, on uh, what I call just business reasonableness as being the test that the Supreme Court should be using about the restrictions that different governments have placed on churches. Uh, when I look at it, um, I know the professor mentioned earlier um, the lack of tax revenue, but an equally valid basis, I guess, for the different restrictions are what's the significance to the economy, if you want to focus on that. Uh, if you shut down a church um, in terms of meeting in person, I don't think it really has a huge significance on the economy. You shut down the airlines and all the transportation that that provides, that has a huge impact or could have a huge impact on the economy. So that's the kind of balancing act that I would expect normal elected government uh, to make as opposed to the courts, who don't seem to be to me particularly well suited for that. Thank you, William. We appreciate your comment. Yeah, that, so that's, um, you know, that's a good point. And, and uh, again, the Calvary Chapel decision in one of the dissents, and Justice Kavanaugh actually brought up not, not specifically tax revenue, I think, but sort of the economic impact. And that was one of the state's arguments that, the, you know, the casinos brought, you know, they employ a lot of people and bring in a lot of revenue. And so that was, you know, certainly one of one of their reasons. And, uh, you know, it, it, that those are, you know, those are trade-offs and, and kind of decisions that uh, that state officials have to make. I think the constitutional question is whether they can prioritize that over the free exercise of, of religion. And so I think on the constitutional question, that's a very difficult argument for, uh, you know, for an election official to make because religion is supposed to be uh, is supposed to be treated at, at, at least as well as the secular, the secular alternative. But I think what helps them in this context is this idea that there are medical and scientific uncertainties, and so I think the court uh, is disposed to, um, you know, to listen to those types of arguments that somehow the, you know, the casinos pose uh, a, a lesser risk. Uh, to public health than the churches, uh, churches being open. Unfortunately, we didn't get, in Calvary Chapel, we didn't get 
uh, any kind of a response from the majority to the argument that the dissenters uh, that the dissenters made on the equality issue, but we, but we did get earlier uh, this year in May, as I mentioned, in the South Bay case, that concurrence from Chief Justice Roberts, and that's really what what he emphasized from Jacobson. Okay. So this is so interesting. I mean, we, we've never had in our lifetime a time like this. Uh, Liz mentioned 9/11, which is somewhat close, but this is longer term, and and you know we we. We don't know when we're going to come out of this. So I think, you know, we're, we're seeing laws made and stretched a little bit. And we talked about these mandatory mask orders. Now, do they violate, do they violate constitutional rights to, to have a mandatory mask order? I've heard people say that, uh, you know, making me wear a mask violates my constitutional rights. I mean, I, I, you know, I think it's the right thing to do, whether I'm mandated to do it or not. And I tend to try to do the right thing, whether I think it's mandated or not. But... Is it, is it a violation of someone's constitutional rights to make them wear a mask? So I think on the issue of the Constitution, the answer is uh, the answer is no. I think that that same precedent, Jacobson, uh, is uh, you know is is still good, and it stands for the proposition uh, that the government can uh, impose these types of uh, these types of limits, including probably something like. Uh, something like wearing a mask during a pandemic. No, one. I, uh, my wife went to the dentist, um, and she was talking to the hygienist, and, and the hygienist said that someone had called in and said that it was against her religion to wear a mask. Is, is there such a thing as, as, can someone claim a religious exception to mandatory mask orders? So that's an interesting one. I, I hadn't heard that one um, I think the general answer is no, and, and we're still kind of talking about uh, talking about the equality rule, right? That so the court uh, has said applies in the context of free exercise, and so to the extent that someone wants an exception from a neutral rule of general applicability, that is a rule that doesn't distinguish between religious and secular activities, uh, they're, they're not going to be entitled to that exception, even if. Uh, they can show that it, in, that it uh, constitutes a burden on their religious exercise. Now, there are some, uh, you know, there are uh, religious liberty statutes that provide uh, kind of more protection, uh, but that would be, I think, a, that would be in, in context like this, maybe a bit of a stretch. Um, but nonetheless, on the constitutional question, I think unless the law, may, you know, the mask ordinance makes a distinction between uh, the religious and the secular, or it has uh, some other comparable exception, uh, then uh, then that is not going to be uh, that that's not going to be a, a valid claim. We have a call waiting. Let's go to Lois in Quitman. Lois, thanks for calling into in legal terms today. What's your comment or question? Lois, you're on in legal terms. What's your comment or question? I just have one question. Hello? Yeah, we're listening to you, Lois. Okay. Uh, my only question is, is that Quitman, Mississippi, or Quitman County? Oh, when I was listing the ones with the executive order, those were counties. Quitman okay. County has an executive order that has extended the stay-at-home. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It's called the Safe Return Executive Order that uh, requires masks and um, has uh, impositions on uh, businesses and gatherings, and that goes on until Monday, August 3rd. Not Quitman the city, but Quitman County. All right, darling. Thank you. Thank you. We are learning about executive orders during pandemics and your constitutional rights. Did you know that many private businesses are requiring masks to do business with them, regardless of where you live? I'm going to tell you about some next. This is In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio.
Hello, I'm Dr. Nancy Lotridge Anderson, president of New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advising firm and co-host of Money Talks. For over 10 years, Money Talks has been answering your personal financial questions and sharing knowledge about money management. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart device's podcasting platform. Thanks for being part of our show in legal terms. If you've missed any of the program, you can listen to the whole show in legal terms dot mpbonline.org it's also available on the mpb public media app as are all our local shows i'm liz gill here with professor richard gershon from the university of mississippi school of law we want to remind everybody that up next is our 11 a.m tuesday southern remedy show relatively speaking with dr susan buttress Now, here is a list of just some of the companies that require you to do to wear a mask to do business with them. Uh, They have the the rules now or some of them are beginning on the first. This is regardless of if you live in a county with a uh, safe return order to wear a mask. Walmart, Kroger, Target, Walgreens. Aldi, I don't know if we have any of those in Mississippi, Apple, AT&T, Bed Bath & Beyond, Best Buy, Costco, CVS, uh, The Gap, Old Navy, Banana Republic, Home Depot, Kohl's, Lowe's, Panera Bread, Starbucks, Trader Joe's, man, I wish we had a Trader Joe's, Verizon, Winn-Dixie, Whole Foods, and now McDonald's. We are talking with Lisa Shaw Roy, professor of law at the University of Mississippi School of Law, about restrictions on religious gatherings and mandatory mask orders. Uh, So, uh, Professor Roy, is it constitutional for companies to require masks, even if the state or local government doesn't require it? Well, to to the extent that uh, private companies impose this sort of requirement, it doesn't really implicate the Constitution. And so we've got uh, we've got a requirement in the law of state action in order to implicate the Constitution. And so these are rights against the government. And so to the extent that private businesses impose these requirements, those do not uh, those do not uh, impinge on uh, or, or, or really involve constitutional rights. So those videos of the person laying on the floor throwing a hissy fit in Costco because it's her constitutional right to uh, not wear a mask in Costco, um, that doesn't quite work. All right, we have a couple of calls. Let's get to before the end of the hour. Let's go to Charles in Biloxi. Charles, uh, what's your comment or question, please? Well, um, I wanted to ask a quick question about your opinion on the school uh, closures and how we're going to get back to school, um, specifically how they're going to make us wear masks um, to school. Constitutionally, can they require you to wear a mask in school? Uh, yeah, I think you get the you know the same answer about wearing masks generally, which is the Jacobson. Uh, Jacobson decision, and um, I, I'm not sure if the caller had more in mind, or maybe a, a you know different different question, or maybe just a uh, perspective about schools or what should happen in uh, in schools in the fall. Well, you know, it's it's interesting, Lisa, because I I think we have the same uh, question here, but we will be requiring everyone to wear a mask for any face to face contact uh, you know, at the university, and I think that's the right thing to do. It certainly, you know, will make things different, and the students will have to be uh, socially distanced. So, uh, you know, if for bigger classes at the law school, we, we're limited on the number of students that can be in a classroom at one time. So there, there, there are going to be some changes. I, I, I Definitely, if we even try to, to do face-to-face, um, but, I, you know, certainly, they, you know, the students can be required to wear, wear a mask, just like you could be required to wear a mask uh, in any any. Uh, business situation as well 
Thanks for calling in, Charles. Let's go to Wayne in Holly Springs. Wayne, thank you so much for calling in to In Legal Terms. What is your comment or question for our show? I'm trying to find out what um, is the court system uh, in Mississippi doing as far as trying to make it more accommodating for uh, what if you have to go into civil court, what, what are you doing to make it more accommodating? For instance, I was in court recently, and you have to wait outside the door. Um, you have 20 people waiting outside in the hot sun with no seating, um, and you, you wait an hour and a half, two hours before your name is called. What is the policy now that Mississippi is adopting? Well, I, I think you know. I'm not sure that either Lisa or I are experts on that. You know that issue particularly, but I do know this. I know that many states have gone to uh, much more online use of uh, courts, and 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 so has Mississippi. So there are hearings and and in, in many courts around the state that have been online. Uh, some even higher court uh, arguments uh, in many states are, are online. Where that's not an accommodation and where this is a, a problem generally is not everybody has good access to the Internet. So, I mean, if we want to fix something, if we want to fix access, we need to provide good access to the Internet for, for all Mississippians. Thanks, Wayne, for that question. Um, Professor Roy, what about um, health exemptions? Um, is there a constitution, you know, if someone says that they can't wear a mask because of health exemptions, exceptions, uh, would that exempt them from um, the, an executive order? You know, as far as I know, most of these, um, you know, most of these orders do have some sort of health exception. I think that's a, you know, that's an important thing to include, particularly if the larger goal is public health. Uh, I believe there was an exception in the Jacobson case, I think, for, uh, for children who couldn't be vaccinated. And so those, would, you know, those are you know, definitely useful things to have. I'm not sure that there's a constitutional requirement that there be a health, health exception. But there is background here of federal law. And so uh, there's the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so uh, there is at least a possibility. And, and that applies, I should say, that applies uh, to, you know, to businesses. And so, uh, you know, there's the, a there's the possibility that there's uh, there's a, there's a, you know federal perhaps right to health exception even if not a constitutional right but as, as far as I understand it most of these orders do uh, do incorporate health exceptions. Well, so Professor we, Gershon, we've got 30 seconds left. Well, I just think Liz, I think you know people have to so surely call to talk about common sense. People have to use common sense. The sooner we all get this under control, the, the faster we can go back to our normal lives and. Masks have been proven uh, to be protective. So, you know, if you wear them right, uh, you know, for a shorter period of time, then we don't have to do this, uh, be doing this next year at this time, we hope. Well, and I would suppose that uh, individuals for health reasons, if they can't wear a mask, then they certainly wouldn't want to get the get the COVID. So I would hope they would take extra measures by not going out into public. Yeah, I've heard a doctor say if you hate wearing a mask, you're going to hate a ventilator. That's right. Professor Roy, we so appreciate you taking time to join our show today. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. That's going to wrap us up for today's In Legal Terms. Our call screener has been great, Michelle McAdoo, and our board engineer is the fabulous Jay White. So for Professor Richard Gershon, who hosts Socially Distant from Me at the University of Mississippi School of Law, I'm Liz Gill, and we hope that you'll join us next Tuesday for In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. 